Okay, um, welcome to the Dreamland XR speaker series. Um, my name is Julie Young. I, um, I am a VR and AR producer. I've done a lot of work with um, Trevor and Lil Michaela at Rudd. Um, and we are here with Trevor McFedries. How are you doing, Trevor? Thanks for having me. As Julie mentioned, uh, I run a little startup called Rudd. I've been deeply passionate about virtual humans, and metaverse, and all kinds of stuff that I think Julie and I nerd out about on our, on our free time. So now we get to share with everybody, which is cool. Yeah, I first met Trevor like I, I want to say like three or four years ago now, um, because I was at a I was at a dinner and um, somebody had said, what, "What's something kind of th that you're passionate about?" And I had I had said, "I'm really excited about virtual humans and this whole idea of Hatsune Miku and, and characters like that." And somebody at the dinner was like, "You have to meet the, like the one other person <laughs> that loves this stuff," and then they introduced me to you, and now here we are. Yeah, it's um, been all this time. Yeah, it's been awesome. I mean, like, it's been fun. I think you've always had like a, like a broader knowledge of the entire ecosystem, I think, from like VR to XR and everything that's going on. So it's been cool to watch this. Thing right. What, um, tell me a little bit about how, like, kind of the impetus for getting, getting started with this stuff. Like, did you, did you kind of start it as a fun experiment or were you thinking like big, you know, were you thinking I'm going to turn this into a company right when you started or how did that come about? Yeah, I think like I, I, I've always had kind of kooky ideas and kind of use my like, you know, delusions of grandeur as kind of a superpower <laughs> where it's like, <laughs> what if I started this virtual celebrity that could scale like software and kind of impact people globally? It's probably not, I think, like the scale most people like start nights and weekend projects on. But like that was kind of the dream. It was it was pretty simple. I was, um you know, I, I've developed talent and was working in music for a long time and you know, software engineer by trade. And so at some point I stumbled into some data uh, around Will and Grace and some other stuff around the Jeffersons. And this idea that, you know, media and narrative and compelling narrative can do more good. Uh, and especially, you know, can, can kind of change uh, our times more effectively than most policy. And so the dream was to say, okay, well, why hadn't there been kind of a global Will and Grace or a global narrative that shifted things uh, for the entire world in a time where we have so many global issues, whether they're economic or climate-based or pandemic-based, the idea that we could have narratives that could help us build a more tolerant of the future was, was kind of this dream. And it started kind of looking in my head more and more like a modern Marvel or Disney along the way. Mm -hmm. And so what made you, um, you know, how did you get to Michaela, like this character of Michaela? Where did that come about? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, this theme of building a more empathetic or tolerant world was, uh, you know, at the core of all of it. And I think, you know, the best storytelling, in my opinion, is informed from kind of like diverse perspectives of how kind of unique anecdotes that they can kind of like riff on or borrow from. And so this idea of kind of creating this character who's kind of this ultimate other, this sentient robot navigating life in a world full of human beings that has like these dreams of becoming a global pop star, kind of these dreams of becoming this, this celebrity and it has impact while kind of creating a lot of really meaningful work was something that I resonated with. I think like being, you know, I grew up in Iowa in a relatively small town as a kind of this like black kid who liked punk rock and hardcore and software. And that wasn't necessarily like what I saw in like popular media. And so that, that story kind of, I think resonated with a lot of people and as a result, it began to stick. But the dream was to kind of like borrow my own story of kind of like feeling like you didn't fit in growing up mm -hmm. and like trying to kind of like embody that in this character that represented some of those things. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, um, what, what led you to wanting to make sort of a, a CG type of character and, and, and going into, into that versus live act? There's lots of ways to tell a story, but you chose this incredibly unique way to do it. So walk me through that process. Yeah, I think, you know, being someone who'd kind of been in the nuts and bolts of making pop music and seeing how, you know, these, these figureheads, what my friend Toby would call like a headless brand, or these people that kind of embody the work of lots of others um, are champion, but oftentimes are kind of um, these centralized, you know, points of failure, where I, I, like lots of people in Hollywood have known the feeling of like waiting on set for Tom Cruise or Rihanna or whatever to show up. The dream was to kind of have all of the appeal and kind of all of, uh, I guess, like all the appeal and all of the relatability of these characters that live in our lives and are able to kind of like explore, you know, our times via their own feelings or their, their own opinions, but at the same time have the scalability of software, right? Like to be able mm -hmm. to explain to people in, in real time. And so creating a, a physical object would have been quite hard. I think one of the joys of software is that you can kind of get in and you can like learn and make mistakes and kind of like, you know, sh iterate into things people love. And so for mm -hmm. me, I, you know, again, 
being a bit delusional, thought like, I could probably figure out how to build a 3D character that can walk and talk and like look and feel as good as a human. That shouldn't be too hard, right? And then you start stumbling down this rabbit hole where you're like, ah, there's a reason people don't do this. This is very hard. And then you're reading about like facts and blend shapes and trying to figure out how to All make- All that good stuff. Work. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, 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 it's, been, it's been a really wild journey, but you've been a part of love it, which is cool. Yeah, I remember when I first met you and like one of the things that stuck out to me most was I had said, like I was coming from a background in VR production, which is just like uh, kind of, it's it's a little bit more like linear thinking, you know, it's like make light, like put people inside experiences and it, it's just a little bit more linear. And so I remember as soon as I met you, you had had kind of the rig and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, I had said, okay, like let's, let's put her in VR. This will be so cool. Like let's, put her in VR and you were and you had said no she should you know she's a robot she lives on the same storytelling store the, the same places that the rest of us tell stories you know Instagram uh Facebook things like that um and so I just thought like it, you had taken this idea that we that a lot of people in kind of 3D had been working on for a long time and flipped it on its head and then approached it from like a much a much more unique kind of special lens I think yeah that's funny people often talk about that like at the beginning that like you know I made it a point especially I mean we haven't even started doing like real press like this until you know four and a half almost five years later at the beginning you know people would be like you know so who is Michaela and I'd be like oh a client of mine I manage her and they'd be like what <laughs> like, yeah yeah I manage Michaela and you know we made it a point to like talk about and to kind of like respect and treat Michaela like a you know traditional creator and as a result mm -hmm. like doing the things that felt quite obvious, like, you know, creating like an augmented reality version of Michaela that could hang out with you in your room, actually kind of like, you know, was antithetical to this idea of kind of creating the scarcity around an object that people traditionally kind of explored objects of that type so, so they wouldn't be scarce. But the kind of like variable rewards component of celebrity, it's kind of like what makes it sticky. You know, this idea that you can't get all of Beyonce that it really mm -hmm. is limited doses is what makes it compelling. And so I think that was a part of it that actually did help make it click. Right. Yeah, that was like my favorite thing. And then you have this quote uh, in your <laughs> in your Twitter profile. Uh, you have the K-Fed of K-Fabe. Yes. Which is something <laughs> that's like a TAM of like you, you know? Like, <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, like, uh, there's this idea of K-Fabe, which is, you know, I guess most popularized by professional wrestling. And this idea that like, you know, I think actually was born out of like, um, you know, carnival culture, like carny culture. Um, this idea of kind of uh, exploring the, these fictional narratives inside of spaces that are traditionally reserved for nonfiction. And that's like the kind of thing that I've always found quite compelling about wrestling. This idea of watching someone get hit with a chair when you're like, wait, this, wait, this was fake, but that seemed real. Like in a world where we have infinite information and infinite resources to kind of understand what's happening, a space to kind of like, I don't know, uh, like perverts the context, uh, it, it, is, it forces you to take pause and you kind of can't keep any scrolling infinitely. And so I've always loved the idea of kayfabe and I've always wanted to explore it. And I think like we've, we've tried to do those things with these characters, like to tell fictional stories inside of Instagram, a space traditionally reserved for like nonfiction, right? Mm -hmm. is, is, is quite compelling and quite fun. And then kayfed is a reference to Kevin's better line um, <laughs> late 90s early aughts Britney Spears one-time husband fame and like I just kind of like the idea of him being this like flash in the pan pop culture figure and so it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek jab at myself as being this like mostly irrelevant m person inside of this <laughs> larger <laughs> theme of Jason. I love it so it went from a tam of me to like a tam of everyone who's watching this <laughs> there we go Scary. <laughs> Um, what are kind of like the biggest, uh, what were your biggest, what have your biggest learnings been throughout the last couple of years as you've sort of like, you know, done this thing that no one has done before in the same way that you're doing it? Um, you know, you mentioned kind of like going into 3D and all those kinds of things. Oh my God, there've been so many learnings. I think at, at the core of it is this idea of, you know, the story is the most important part. Mm -hmm. you know, early on, I was really fascinated with like, reinventing shaders and like, you know, trying new things with rigs and like figuring out like, you know, more efficient ways and like a, a, a rethinking pipelines to create animations, you know, like better, faster, cheaper. And at the end of it, like I'd be so pumped to ship something in a novel way. 
And, you know, the fans would be like, yeah, but like, is she wearing a cool outfit? Or like, what happened to that? Like, <laughs> or, something? or like, are her friend or still friends? And I'm like, oh yeah. Like you can do all of this cool, shiny behind the scenes stuff. At the end of the day, if the story is not great, then like nobody cares. And uh -huh. so that part is really compelling to me. I think, you know, often we get caught up in like these black mirror narratives about how like, you know, every, you know, technology and AI is going to eat everyone's life. But I think the really compelling stuff and the really hard stuff is that story stuff. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. That's why we're actually like, you know, I always describe our org as kind of like this really humanistic org. We want to augment human yeah. to share stories at scale, but like the magic is the human stuff and you can't replace that. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through some of the sort of like the the moments in Michaela's story so far that have unfolded? What were like the, the points that sort of hit the most or uh, maybe first you can talk about the points that hit the most and then maybe second talk about like about like points that surprised you personally. Yeah, I mean, the man, there's so many. It's like dedicated fan wikis to all this stuff. But I think yeah. like, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that like we kind of wanted to have this prequel story that shifted into kind of like the, the, the first episode, so to speak. And mm -hmm. you know, in this prequel, Michaela was unaware of her own identity. And, you know, in this moment that like, you know, it's kind of colloquially called the hack. Um, you know, her Instagram was hacked and all of her posts deleted. And this other character, Bermuda, was inserted into the timeline. And um, Bermuda, of course, was created by this company, Kane Intelligence, which is kind of this evil body that Michaela Lawrence had originally created her. And that, like, our company, Rudd, which in the narrative is kind of like a Professor X's school for the gifted of sorts, um, you know, had lied to her and kind of betrayed mm -hmm. her trust. She went out on her own. And, like, that moment was pretty complicated because it required us really exploring this idea of transmedia narrative in a way that I think felt quite novel, but also would have been our dream, you know, like telling stories across different channels with different characters, introducing like songs into the equation, you know, mm -hmm. blog, all kinds of stuff. And then the added layer of it being validated through press and the media. And, you know, when I talk to the team or when I talk to others about like modern storytelling, I often reference like the Kardashian Jenner West as being like so good at leveraging these different vehicles for narrative and you know one of them being this kind of tier that your super fans operate on on your socials another layer being like the press layer kind of like a tmz layer it's kind of like mm -hmm. you know rehashing it for a more passive fan and then the most passive fan engaging in like keeping up with the kardashians like a linear television show um so right like, so the ability to kind of like check that bottom layer and then that kind of middle layer as well really allowed us to kind of like kickstart it into this next this next year and um that was super cool. Um, trying to think of things that like shocked me or kind of exploded me. I think like what's been fun is kind of building this story in a kind of lockstep with the community and the fans as they've built their own kind of like places to communicate and see and like discuss what they'd want to see. It's been fun to kind of pull them into the equation. And I think my dream has always been to kind of like take this platform and enable other creative people to build their own characters and kind of like let these characters act as like heat shields for all mm -hmm. of like, you know, the, all the tough stuff that comes with being a public figure. And so I think being able to enable that piece and then also potentially enabling like a whole community to create characters and deliver value to those characters is like, you know, the near future and a future that I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, I, I like this, this whole idea of like transmedia storytelling and like specifically transmedia IP, I think is so interesting because like what you guys did is you took this main hero character and then, um, you know, developed all these, this plot line around her, but then developed other characters around her. So it's like, you know, in the same way that somebody might, you know, really follow, just like you were saying, like somebody might really follow Kylie Jenner, but maybe they're not following the rest of the family as closely. Um, and, it, but it's cool how that, you know, one IP kind of like scales itself really well amongst these different, you know, types of characters. Um, so I guess my question is how have, because a lot of storytelling today, there's these like recognized structures that everybody works within, right? There's like, like there's a four act screenplay and <laughs> you, you know, you have like the, like act one, act two, act three, act four. It's very, um, you know, you can kind of write to this one structure and there are things that there's a, a way to keep people kind of engaged. And then you know how much conflict to introduce, how to have them overcome the conflict, how to make, how to make the viewer feel like they're kind of winning along with your character. Um, how do you kind of look at the stories that you guys write? Because you have this, you know, you have to set up 
you have to kind of like plant the seeds of conflicts that will happen later while mm -hmm. not taking away from what's happening now. How do you think about that? Or how did you kind of like recruit a team that thinks that way? I mean, it's been a lot of uh, trial and error. I think, you know, when into this with some VCs that they wanted to explore, and I think, you know, a lot of them were defined by an era of the internet that had sort of like chronological feeds, you know? Mm -hmm. and so I think like watching like TikTok or Instagram kind of blow those things up means that you kind of have to like, I mean, like, you know, iterate and try to figure out different ways for taking people on a linear journey. And it's probably not entirely dissimilar from like the challenges that VR producers have, right? Where like you can look anywhere in a frame, like how do you take people down a path? And I actually think like the, the next logical step in, in, in this kind of type of storytelling or in like the future of storytelling to me actually probably feels a bit more like in ARG, like in, you know, like a augmented or alternate reality game where you kind of have like an outcome that maybe is predefined is like desirable, you know, maybe it's a, a cash prize or it's, you know, some status thing or whatever it is. And you've got a certain set of variables that are defined at the beginning and you're kind of letting people solve for them collectively through these different spaces and maybe navigating media or things that you've, you know, you've already created, but also letting them like interact with them and iterate on them. And I think gaming yeah. often speaks to that really well, but I also think that like, like, you know, QAnon speaks to that really well. Yeah. You know? like I think that there are these groups of people who are trying to collectively solve problems that are larger than themselves and organizing around those problems and in the process, like navigating media that was created, you know, by a source like Q, but also kind of creating their own media and letting people interact with those things. And so I think allowing people to become part of the story is is like directionally right. But I don't think it like it means like deep faking yourself onto Tom Cruise's body <laughs> inside of Mission Impossible, <laughs> like how people talk about it sometimes. Right. Yeah. How do you view the role of like um, like participation from an audience member? I know that like with Hetsune Miku, for example, that her fan base is writing the lyrics to the songs. Totally. Um, so it's just this huge way of like interacting with not only just other members of the community, but with like the character themselves. So how do you view that with Michaela or with any I, of I, other characters? That's like the dream end state for us. I think, you know, in the West, like we had kind of this belief system that if we wanted to see that come to pass, we had to kind of be the first through the door in a more traditional way to kind mm -hmm. of like make people understand the value proposition. Cause I think, you know, trying to, I mean, you know, when it was you and I that were excited about this idea only, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, trying to explain to a brand or like to a, you know, any kind of larger public figure why this is important or why it was interesting didn't make a ton of sense. But when mm -hmm. you saw, you know, Michaela on the cover of a huge magazine or on a billboard in Times Square or in a, Calvin Klein campaign with Bella Hadid, they were like, oh, holy shit. And this character speaks Mandarin and Portuguese and English and Spanish. Like, that's crazy. And you're like, totally. Right. And I think now once there's like a certain, you know, a, a amount of value ascribed to this idea, then it becomes like, okay, now we can kind of get a critical mass of people around it to support it because they, they see themselves as part of that value structure or system. And so I think the dream for us again is to say, okay, like, look, we built this thing I'd love to be able to offload it to people and then tie some of like the, the value like fiscally, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, like real dollars to that community as well. And I think that's where like, you know, the crypto piece comes into the equation and why selling a Michaela NFT for a hundred thousand dollars is like totally insane, but also like the future. Yeah. That's like, I, I honestly think that that's one of the coolest things that happened this year in kind of the like future tech space. Can you tell people, can you explain that for people who don't know what, what exactly happened? Yeah, so it's kind of two pieces to it. Um, for folks that aren't like, you know, aware of the crypto stuff, there is like the Bitcoin thing, which is kind of more, you know, it gives like a store of value. And there's a whole other, you know, chain and, and ecosystem on the Ethereum uh, blockchain that allows for a, a couple of different things. But one of them is this idea of non-fungible tokens or effectively creating these tokens that represent, um, you know, a, a, a something that, that, that uh, you know, something like a one of one or something or, or uh, embody uh, an object or a thing that isn't explicitly fungible. And so what we did is we effectively auctioned off, uh, a, you know, a GIF, you know, a, a small video file of Michaela on uh, a marketplace called Super Rare. And the kind of, you know, bizarre thing is that this, this video file or this GIF that could be screenshot or screen record or shared all over the internet sold for, you know, close to $100,000, um, so which, is, cool. which is totally crazy, but I think represents this like really important shift 
from um, you know these like two modalities you've had in media where it's like things are kind of valuable because they're scarce, or we try to like you know figure out models around making things universally accessible, but still kind of drive the value of media down quite a bit. Whereas it's like you know Spotify or you know YouTube or whatever it is. And one intriguing thing about this like coming model is this idea that things, and I think in the near future, media especially can be individually ownable, but also universally accessible. And that's gonna allow for, I think, creators to both like share their work with the world, but also, you know, get a ton of benefits and hopefully allow communities that are powering these creators um, to do the same. And so that's something that I'm trying to make sense of and try to like scope out for our future, but, you know, hopefully for the space's future as well. Uh huh. Yeah, how do you think about, uh, again, kind of this concept of like rewarding people who participate in the narrative? Yeah, I think like, again, programmable money makes that a lot easier, but I, yeah. you know, <laughs> but I think like, immediately, that. <laughs> immediately people have tried to, I think people try to do that, you know, in lots of ways. I remember like in the late nineties, there being these like street teams for record releases where it was like, we'll send you posters and like advertising materials. And if you post them all over the street, like we paste them on your block and like take pictures, then we'll send you like free band merch. And so mm. it's like, there are ways for incentivizing people to be a part of these narratives, but I think you know, uh, you know, one of the great things is if you watch, you know, decentralized finance on Ethereum like create all of these pretty explicit reward systems for people that go and like champion these tokens in these communities. And when you partner that with like real value, uh, real external value, then you get like really, really interesting things. And so I think you know what I'd love to see is like yes, people building these kind of solutions and kind of like you know, more traditional web two ways where it's like, hey, if you're, you know, contributing a bunch of value to this this platform, you're gonna get a bunch of followers. And, and, and like those followers not having a total like um, literal relationship to dollars to a world where it's like, man, actually like these tokens or these other like forms of value that are kind of locked in the ecosystems can actually be, you know, traded or kind of like, uh, you know, exchange for, uh, you know, real literal value that can apply to my, my, my daily life. Um, mm -hmm. really you could trade your, you know, Twitter followers for, you know, <laughs> US dollars or whatever. Like you can imagine a marketplace where we're selling like, you know, Julia Young follows or something like that. And yeah, I feel like I've seen so many, you know, we've seen so many crypto projects over the last couple of years. Um, some of them, some of them like didn't make a lot of sense, but I think the ones that do make a lot of sense are, this whole idea of like you're you know you're owning sort of a, a limited supply of access to a database whether it's whether it's like a literal database of information or you know kind of like you were alluding to a community online of sort of scarce resources or um you know in this case it's it's there's there's a scarcity with respect to like what is in Michaela's world and what people can do or create or have happen in that world um so it's kind of cool this idea of Th there's this whole database of information and as people contribute to it, it becomes each of the individual contributions become more valuable. I think that's totally right. And I think that's what you've seen in crypto, you know, like that's such a simple concept, but so powerful. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, these crazy Bitcoin surgeries is because like all your cousins are in it 32K, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe they can pump the price a little bit. There's like these, these really warped incentive structures that can be quite powerful if they're kind of contained and like, you know, operate with a little more measured approach. Right. Um, okay, now that we've gone down the crypto, the crypto rabbit hole, we'll, go, <laughs> we'll return back to the metaverse rabbit hole. So um, the metaverse, I feel like has been this idea that, um, you know, in the last 18 months or so has just taken off on Twitter, or at least in my bubble of Twitter. Um, yeah. Just this whole idea that, um, you know, we're, it's, it's not so much a literal thing as I think it is a figurative thing, but just, you know, that our future is going to be very digital and um, we're going to be able to do, you know, have a lot of shared experiences there that are real time, that have a lot of people, that have a lot of different, you know, that you can kind of program to some extent. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of like your general feelings around that idea, but then two kind of like companies that you think uh, are doing interesting things there, other than Brad, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, it, uh, it's, it's one of those things where I kind of have to take a step back because a lot of it feels so obvious to me. Like it, over the break, uh, I saw a friend's parent who's like a pretty successful guy because he bought a bunch of real estate, you know, in like New York and like LA in the like late 70s, early 80s type stuff. And I think in times when those places were pretty uh, undervalued 
And the way he was talking about like his vision for like young people all moving to the city and like reinvigorating these places, I think probably felt as abstract or bizarre as like, you know, us talking about a lot of our, even more of our lives, you know, living, being experienced virtually and like more value accruing virtually. But I kind of like the way I explain it to friends that makes the most sense usually is when I got ready for the first day of school, you know, I would buy a new outfit because I wanted to impress the 400 kids in my school or whatever, or like leave a good impression. <laughs> a status game associated with that mentality. But now I think when young people buy outfits, like, you know, they're not buying them for IRL interactions. They're buying them to take a picture to put them on, post them online because you can get millions of interactions versus like the hundreds you get that day or whatever it is. And I think that like this idea that an outfit being more valuable because of what it can communicate virtually than what it does IRL is still kind of tough for people to grasp. Mm -hmm. But I think like, that general shift is kind of what I see more and more of taking place. So. All that is to say, like becoming metaverse stuff, I love thinking about, and, and I think, you know, we're obviously kind of like building for that future with this idea that hopefully our characters can be kind of this connective tissue. I think some people see right. different things, kind of like web two, and then like spatial computing, you know, metaverse future. I would like to think that there will need to be, um, you know, characters or people or things that can kind of like walk you through the, you know, like this, this big of a shift. I am um, old enough to remember America Online, which is weird, I'm 35, I don't know, it's like I'm 60 years old, but like, when America <laughs> Online. You're ancient. <laughs> yeah, like I remember thinking about, um, you know, AOL as being this like portal online for like my parents and yeah. um, them having AOL keywords and like, they'd be like, go to AOL keyword sports. And like that, I think for like my parents was like opening the sports section in the paper or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what that, that keyword did is it just like took you, I think, like ESPN.com or whatever. <laughs> and, and so like they're kind of this connective tissue between like the newspaper and the World Wide Web. Like, like how do I go, how do I, how do I make sense of this new thing? And I think there's going to need to be those things. That's why like, we like to exist, I think, is having characters that can say, you understand how I exist on Instagram or TikTok. This is how I exist in this space. And if you can connect how I exist to there and how I exist here, maybe you can make that logical leap as well. Um, as far as other people doing cool stuff in the space, like I do think there's some bizarre stuff happening in the crypto space with like Decentraland or crypto voxels and people that are thinking about space. And I think like that to me is really intriguing. I'm kind of an architecture nerd. And so reimagining space and that like coming metaverse is really cool to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are people that are, you know, building kind of communication stuff. So like scalable chat and the kind mm -hmm. of like, uh, you know, uh, natural language processing to me is probably undervalued in something that will make this, these new spaces really compelling. Uh, and then obviously the people that are like powering this stuff, like I think Tim Sweeney and Epic's vision of like kind of an open metaverse is really compelling. Um, I, I'm really excited to see them do their thing. Niantic obviously is doing some really incredible stuff. I think, you know, we're both big fans of Snap. And I think mm -hmm. Snap is kind of like, a, again, like really underappreciated for what they've built even like the trust they've built as a brand that will allow us to like share our location in real time with all of our friends. Like that's pretty rare for a big technology company. And so mm -hmm. there's going to be lots of cool stuff being built out of those big companies for sure. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you said kind of like scalable chat and NLP, you view that as something that will be like undervalued in the metaverse. Yeah, I mean, I think natural language processing, I mean, if you play up with GPT-3, it's like scary good. It's kind of like all of those big AI fears that we've heard for a long time. You like play with that and you're like, oh. I haven't what? played it, but I've kind of seen people posting on Twitter. <laughs> it's truly amazing stuff, right? And so I think yeah. there's, I think the ability to kind of augment yourself and to do more, do more good uh, more efficiently, I think will be really interesting, right? And so the idea that people, it's kind of weird, almost like that, that moot point in her where he's like, wait a minute, you have like thousands of relationships like this? Like, I, I imagine, you know, being able to kind of like scale your identity into this kind of like virtual space will kind of inspire people to have like, you know, multiple identities in parallel. I think oh, I, I'd like, you know, on the internet, I kind of have different identities. I have like, my like, you know, Rinsta, my Finsta, so to speak, like, you know, I think like people, I didn't know you had a Finsta. Yeah, well, we'll get you on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think people having their kind of forward facing, you know, corporate friendly identities and then other identities for different spaces, I can imagine in that metaverse, I and mean, oftentimes understood us kind of living as our like 
you know, IRL meet space cells, but like in a virtual space, I think it would be, you know, helpful for people to be able to embody the different versions of themselves in this virtual world. And so I imagine being able to communicate at scale via these different things would uh, mm -hmm. enable new types of behavior as well. And so I think whenever I, I think of like new formats emerging I, or, or, or new kind of technologies emerging, I think it's easier to support formats to kind of say like, you know, we're going to read books on the radio. And then someone goes like, well, what if there were like two, you know, shock jocks talking back and <laughs> forth? And that becomes like, oh yeah, that's a way better medium for this. Um, and so I think that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for on the edges that I think actually might be more effective than, you know, Ready Player One or something mm -hmm. like that. Like, I, I totally agree with you. And I think like, especially in the last, like since quarantine started and I've been working from home, I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of people have started to feel this, this future in a much more, not, not tangible, but like digitally tangible way. <laughs> um, like, it's like, I've never spent so much, more, so much time on Twitter, but I also feel like I have got these group chats on Twitter that feel to me kind of like what I, what I would have used as like, you know, water cooler type talk at, at my, yeah. at my, uh, at my co-working space. So um, how much do you think of this is here to stay versus like, you know, I, I guess the question is, um, what types of IRL things do you think will be sort of the, the last to transition into kind of like a digital first world? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, 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 I guess I, there are things that I like kind of would, would hope for and then probably like the, the stark reality that will actually kind of like answer that question. Uh, I think what I would like to see come to pass is there were kind of like, I feel like there was a bit of like a, a race to the bottom for a lot of live experiences, right? Like I think, you know, mm -hmm. Geno of Ice Cream and some of these other things were like novel, but effectively they became like spaces to like, again, better to define our virtual selves. And I think if we've got like good experiences and we've got a lot of like, you know, if we can create, you know, if we can create content or experiences in virtual spaces that actually then like translate even better to our virtual like content bubbles, it's Instagram or TikTok, whatever it is, then like some of our IRL experiences, maybe it creates space for IRL experiences to kind of like differentiate and to provide mm -hmm. something totally different or novel. Um, this is like a bad analogy, but I often think like when I go to music festivals, it's like, I'll, I'll hear like, you know, you go to the Sahara tent, like the DJ area and you're like, yeah, man, like just one, like, you know, a stereo left and right out of like a big EDM song that's gonna sound so much bigger than like a eight piece rock band on stage, all mic'd and stuff. Like, it's just gonna mm -hmm. sound smaller. And this is like, a band, again, like a TAM of one like, analogy. But I think this idea that if you go and you experience a band that isn't trying to compete on like a loudness or like big flashy kind of like EDM style experience, but is competing on like lyrics and songwriting and kind of like deep kind of like visceral primal human stuff that's when they really win and so i'm kind of interested in like experiences live experiences recognizing that they can't compete on kind of a superfluous like you know, kind of like virtual space like ar and you know being able to augment your space all that stuff i think is like going to like feel like the obvious way to do that but i actually think they can kind of compete on more personal human ways that's when they become more compelling um, that was like me kind of like thinking on the fly, but, <laughs> um, no, I love it. <laughs> what I imagine what will, what will like, you know, actually happen is that a lot of people will recognize that a lot of the, you know, perceived value or the things that we were like taught to believe were the value from like coming together, um, and, and like hanging out IRL, it, it probably, you know, isn't true. And it's a lot of like the kind of in between things and the soft things. And I think that's been like clear for public education. Like you don't really go to Harvard to necessarily be in the room with the professor as much as you go to like build a community or like walk to class together or kind of mm -hmm. like, I think that kind of stuff is, is will probably be the last to, I think to like to go. I think we're gonna still place a lot of value on kind of doing the thing between the thing together. And so yeah. I don't know what that means necessarily, but I do see people in my own life like getting deeper into like mushroom foraging or kind of like, <laughs> you know, things that um, feel to me less defined than like, I don't know, a soul cycle class because mm -hmm. I think that can shift IRL, but these things that are kind of more open-ended quests where you can just kind of go and you stumble in the conversation or whatever. Yeah, or like kind of community, community oriented, like 
chill, less structured things. Yeah, exactly. I think that's probably a really, really long-winded way of, of me saying like, again, the magic of having things that are less structured. Uh, yeah. And I think we're seeing that just with the sheer number of companies now that are trying to um, address this issue of exactly like not having these kind of like spontaneous sort of office type things, which I think is really important, especially for companies that are highly creative, you know, such as Brad. Yeah, totally. The things between the things. Um, okay, so I think we're almost ab about at time. Is there anything else that you um, you want to add? Anything you've been dying to talk about? Oh, man. Um, it's fun just to talk. I feel like I've been like, I was doing a bunch of that over break in the last couple of days. I've been like locked in the office or like in my little home office, like getting after it. But um things I'd love to talk about. I mean, I think it's clear this year, I just was tweeting this, like it's gonna be a year where we talk a lot about speech, about decentralization, decentralization about censorship, and it's a, gonna be a really tricky one. And so uh, I, I'm excited to see those kind of like conversations take place. I think it's an important one, but I don't have any good takes right now, so probably wrap it up. <laughs> um, okay, well, I guess that concludes, concludes our fireside chat. Thank, Thank you so you. much for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dreamland. <laughs>